we have exactly 55 minutes left. And I think I have 20 more slides. So we're gonna buzz through some of this. Um, have you guys felt like this has been helpful today? Yes. Okay. I never really know when I do a lot of talking if like you're just thinking or if you're bored or if you're checked out or what. But um, we we spent quite a bit of time on aggressive and violent behavior. I want to speak to a couple pieces that we didn't talk about with that. Please keep in mind that many kids who are aggressive and violent are that way because they've learned that behavior. Okay? It's a part of their language. Especially little guys. So I come from a family of spankers. I share that. I absolutely do not advocate spanking in any way, especially for traumatized children. Because when you're little and you've witnessed people hitting each other, and then you get hit for being in trouble, hitting is hitting is hitting. There's no difference in that. Does that make sense? So, and I'm not saying that all kids who get spanked who have trauma are gonna turn out bad. I'm not saying that anyway, okay? We know, as you heard in the video, we know that kids who've experienced trauma come out pretty well, right? But there are some kids who are really little, who are violent, and that's because they've learned that behavior. They're also seeing that behavior. So for example, I have a family who, extreme domestic violence. Dad beats up mom every single day and has threatened to kill her four or five times. And they have two little ones under the age of six. So what does six year old start doing? Beating people up, okay? If we keep getting him in trouble, if we keep talking to him about everything he's doing wrong, he's gonna keep doing that behavior because that's what he's learning at home. He actually is trying to communicate and we have to get to the place of this is how you communicate in a healthy way. Now those are really tough patterns to, to break, okay? So when you have violent and aggressive people, kids, teens, people, I recommend you build your team. There needs to be outside people involved. It can't just be educators. Because while you are awesome and amazing, you can't do everything and you have 30 other children to worry about. Right? So please keep in mind, it's okay to ask for outside help. There's so many reasons that drive aggressive behavior. Another reason I've seen aggressive behavior is when people think they're gonna get attacked. When their fear response is so strong and maybe you're bending down to talk to them and have a conversation and that feels really scary. So we call that an intimacy barrier, right? So can I pick on you, Vicki, for just a moment, please? Okay. So I'm going to get into Vicki's space and I want you to tell me when I'm too close to you, Vicki. Oh, Vicky. <laughs> right? Okay, so Vicky has the ability to say I'm too close. Okay? And that's pretty close. Some kids, I, I broke her intimacy barrier. She was like, enough. Some kids, the barrier is way out here. And when you think about classroom settings, how close do we put kids together? They're pretty close, right? It's not, and then if you put them aside, put them away from a kid, people are like, oh my gosh, they're not being included. We're not doing inclusive education. Well, what we might be doing is we might res be respecting their intimacy barriers. So please keep that in mind. Little kids who bite, right? That is oftentimes about you're in my space. Get the heck out of it. Or uh, there's no way for me to get out of this. I feel cornered and I'm going to bite you. Now I'd say that's always a reason, but that's sometimes a reason. So aggressive and violent behavior has a lot of different drivers, but I want you to keep in mind that many of these kids, that's what it's been modeled for them. So instead of having a conversation about everything they're doing wrong, teach them what to do right. When you disagree with someone, you don't need to punch them in the face. If you have a problem with me, we can chat about it. 
This is what that looks like. And then you model that. There's so much modeling that has to happen. When you're a little person and you grow up in a healthy home, how much do you see in that? You see stuff all the time, right? You become aware of the routines and the, and the rhythm of your home. But when you don't have that, you become aware of other routines and other rhythms. All right, and I would build your team, okay? Especially for men, be aware of your presence. <coughs> many, unfortunately, many of the kids who've been mistreated, they've been mistreated by men. And they have warped senses of what safety means, right? And so just be aware of your presence. If you can make yourself smaller in some way, that will be helpful. If you can sit on the floor, if you can talk at their level, I always try to make myself smaller. Remember the story about the guy that was really intense, right? And what did I do? I sat on the floor. And then he sat on the couch. There was still that power differential, but he was in control of it, not me. He was no longer threatened by me. So just be aware of that. Tone of voice, sometimes if you whisper or you talk softer, that can also decrease violence and aggression. When you come in and do the intervention, instead of saying, hey, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? Tell me what's up. And you're intentionally changing your tone of voice, that can be really helpful. Any questions about that? Okay, body interventions. We've talked a lot about this. Breathing and heart rate management. Okay, this is one of my favorite breathing techniques. Everybody up? We don't have to stand up. Everybody put your hands up, okay? We're blowing up our balloons, people. Okay? And then we're gonna blow them up. So we breathe in and we blow up. I do this with people of all ages. I do this at family outings. <laughs> I do this at family reunions. <laughs> because it's a visual. Now, kids, when they learn this, they'll go like this. <laughs> you don't want them to do that. They'll pass out. You want them to learn slow up, slow down. Slow up, slow down, right? I do stuff like that to learn about breathing because it's visual. People will give you, you know, what is it, the four, seven, eight strategy. You breathe in for four, you hold it for seven, you breathe out for eight. It's a great strategy, but if you can add movement to it, it makes it better strategy. Because then you have a visual. And if you give your kids permission to do that, like our, our daughter does this at a restaurant all the time. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, it's pretty overwhelming. I can understand that. So we're all sitting at the restaurant booth, breathing, trying to get through. So the point is, if you give them permission, then you have a visual of when someone's becoming overwhelmed. And you can tune in and check into that. So you teach them strategies that are visual, that makes your job a little easier. Then you don't have to interpret what's going on inside of them. Okay? All right, sleep and appetite. Not necessarily the sleep appetite, but sleep and appetite. <laughs> I deleted the slash. I would love part of checking in with your kids to be around how much time have you slept and have you had breakfast, right? How many of you get hangry? <laughs> right, this is, I love her, she's like, me! And I bet everybody in your life knows it, right? Yeah, my husband's like, it appears that you might need a snack, Stacy. <laughs> I'm like, how'd you know? <laughs> Right? Food always makes me better. <laughs> okay? So keep that in mind. Healthy snacks, super important. Right? If you, have a, if you have an option for kids to bring snacks or snacks availability, and I get a little bit twitchy when there are teachers who are sometimes like, it's not snack time. You can have snack. It's not snack time. And I'm kind of like, you got a kid who's traumatized, abused, and neglected, who's listening to when they're hungry? Let them eat! <coughs> they need to eat. <coughs> Because no one's listened to that. They're learning about their, their own needs and their own stuff, okay? Sleep is hugely important. Sometimes kids need a nap, right? I kind of wish we all had nap time. We talked about that a little earlier today. 
But wouldn't we be happier if we had a little downtime in our day and we weren't just going and going and going? And if you think developmentally about kids, how many kids have missed that stage where they got regular naps? Like nap time's regular, you know, until four, five, six years old. Even in kindergarten they have, sometimes you have like mats down, right? That's pretty regular. Sometimes kids miss that completely. They don't know how to calm themselves. They don't know how to soothe themselves. They don't know how to regulate. They don't know how to be silent. Some of these kids don't know how to just sit in silence with themselves. Those are huge life skills, okay? Because dysregulated children who never learn regulation will have dysregulated children. True or false? This is a generational deal. So if we can give them moments of learning regulation, we are helping the future of our nation. All right. Brain breaks, we've kind of done those all day, right? So planks, that's another fabulous brain break. Brain break. You cannot really concentrate on a lot of things when you're doing a plank. Is that, I mean, really, like try to think about something else outside of that plank. For people who can, they can plank for a lot longer. I'm not there yet. I'm like, I hate the plank. I'm shaking. But what that does is it's engaging the whole body. And that's exactly what kids need. We talked about yoga poses, right? Some teachers have yoga poses all over the room, and sometimes they'll just ring a bell and you take a yoga pose. And they can do whatever they want, and they can try that. And then you try to hold it for longer periods of time. Is that a life skill? Yes. Why is doing a yoga pose a life skill? Is it about the yoga pose? No. It's, it's about self-care, right? It's about managing your body. It's about being respectful of your body, okay? Oh, look on Pinterest. And you also, you guys gave me some great websites. So, Go Noodle. And school moves. School they moves. They have classroom oriented, so that it's written. It's an she's an educator. She writes it on posters and things you can put right in the classroom, right with your curriculum. She, she's well aware of Tom Ford and all things that are required. So she actually does great writes for that. Cool. They're very appropriate and not destructive. Okay, so school moves, Go Noodle, Brain Gym. Any other great websites you guys have? What's that? Any other great websites you guys have to share about brain breaks? Okay. All right, engaging your core. While it's important to do common core, it's also important to engage your core. <laughs> They're directly related, right? Attunement, we haven't said this word very much today, but we've talked a lot about this concept. So attunement means that I, as an adult, I'm literally tuned in to what's going on with you as a kid, and I'm getting it. And I'm not putting on my stuff on you. So, I hear that you found the pen at recess. <coughs> I hear you think I'm a, that you think I'm a liar. I hear that. I hear you think that I'm calling you a liar. Okay, I'm with you. This must be a hard conversation to have, right? It's around reading what you see happening with the kid, but reading it accurately. Wow, you must be really scared. You know, I had a kid punch me, and I said to the kid, instead of, oh my god, you punched me, I can't believe that happened. I said, holy cow, I must have really scared you. You must have really needed me to leave you alone. And they were like, yeah. Why? Like, I shifted how I approached that kid. Right? And they were like, why did you say that? I said, well, I know the only time I ever feel angry. Every time I want to hit somebody is when I'm really upset, I'm really scared, I really need somebody to get on my face. Like, well, yeah, you nailed that. That's exactly how I felt. Well, what can I do to help you never feel that way again with you and I? Right? Kids who have attachment issues at home don't get attunement. They don't get someone who's attuned to them. So part of being that person in their life is being attuned to them. So I want you guys to take two minutes. I want you guys to talk in your group about a time you've been tuned in to a kid and you've shown them attunement and what that looks like. If you have questions about it, raise your hand and I'll come chat with you. Okay? Go.
Were you able to easily identify a time that that has happened? How many say yes? You could easily identify that. How many say no? Yes. How many don't know? Okay. So as you are engaging with kids and you're applying what we've talked about today, you will know when that moment happens. Because what will happen is you'll feel kind of warm and fuzzy and they'll feel warm and fuzzy. And you'll have that intimate moment where you got it. And they were like, you got it. And they're few and far between sometimes with some kids. But it's, a, it's an honor when that happens, actually. Because they're letting you into their life, right? And they're letting, they're showing you that you understand them. And that makes them a little bit vulnerable. Because most of these kids have pretty tough skin. And they're not going to let just anybody into their lives. And they're definitely going to let you in if they think you're going to hurt them. So when you get to tune in and you get to show them that you understand what they might be feeling, that's an honor. And that's a good, good job on you because not very many people get to do that. Okay? Goes back to relationship. Have we, have we kind of hit on relationship today? Maybe a little bit? Kind of the crux of what we're talking about, right? When we talk about it, sometimes it seems obvious, but in practice, it doesn't always happen, right? So I've been in lots of classrooms with lots of really amazing people, and sometimes I miss the boat with relationship, okay? And positive touch, we've talked about that today too, right? So we've talked about a lot of this stuff. Anybody have any questions about touch? It's gotta be safe. You have to keep in mind that a lot of these kids have blueprints around touch that are not positive. Uh, one dilemma with positive touch that um, I may be experiencing at my place of work in preschool um, is that when we have a problem, we kind of go to refocus to try to gather up all the broken pieces of what just happened. And we have some kids who do not want to sit down. So, and I've had other jobs where, yeah, if a kid will not take a time out, you need to hold him there. And with some of the kids at my current job, that is not an option. <laughs> you cannot hold them in time out. And so we <coughs> just um, have him go to his own area and he just has to stay contained in this area until he cools down and then we can try to re-engage him and get going back to where we were. Um, but then earlier in the presentation, we were talking about, well, you want your discipline to be a relationship oriented, but he doesn't want anything to do with us. We're the enemy. So it's really hard, and some of us have really good relationships with him, whereas other, like myself, I'm, I'm only there two hours a day. And um, these car crashes that we have all the time happen when sometimes when the person has a relationship with them is not there. So saying we have been working on our team development, trying to get us all on the same page, mm -hmm. but it's always so unpredictable with him, and he is so violent and aggressive. It's hard to know where, where the release should be and whether we should be trying to touch or not, because there's a lot of unsafe timing with him. So, Great question. How many of you have that same dilemma? I mean, this is a balancing act, right? Like there's no hard and fast rule around this. What I will say is, I do believe in the relationship piece of him kind of being in containment, but that relationship isn't always talking. Sometimes it's just presence, right? And so I have, I think we talked about this in the first session. I have a strategy called the hope method. We talk about that hold on past the emotion. So that means that you are just in that space, maybe even a little bit outside of his space of containment, holding on past that emotion. You are there holding that emotional space with them so that they know they're not alone, right? It's that same concept of baby cries. I hold baby until baby's done crying. And in this case, if he doesn't want to be touched, you don't touch him, but you are in his, presence so he knows that while he's in crisis there's someone safe there with him does that make sense and so that's called a time in versus a time out so time out is for adults 
You need to go get yourself put together so that you can interact with people. Tie them in is about, okay kiddo, you're having a huge emotion. I know it's really hard to handle on your own. I'm here for you and I'm gonna stay present with you. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. Now it's complicated, right? Because you are the enemy. He doesn't want you in your life. But think about why you're the enemy and why he doesn't want you in your life. Because he probably has some other experiences where people have never held that space with him. Or when he has these big, huge emotions, he might be really scary. And people are scared of him. They don't know what to do with that. Well, I'm telling you, these kids have big, huge emotions. So we have to get to a place where we can handle that. And sometimes it's just being present. I have had so many opportunities to just be present with kids because I don't know what to say. I don't know how to support a kid and what to say to a kid who witnessed murdering their parent. One parent murdering another. I don't know what to do with that. What I do know what to do is to sit and be with them and let them have all the feelings they have about that. And there are a lot of feelings, right? Probably sad, mad, angry, scared, all those things. Loss, grief, right? We don't know always what to do with really big emotions, so we get scared of that, and that's one of the reasons we push people away. But when we pull people closer and we say, what you're going through might be really scary right now, and I'm present with you, I can't solve it. And depending on language, you don't say all that. You just show it. But with some kids, you might say that, right? My 16-year-old, one of the 16-year-old girls I work with, sometimes I tell her, wow, you've been through some really tough stuff. I, I don't know what that's like. I haven't been through that. I have no idea what you're feeling. I know that I can handle it, though. I know I can be with you as you talk about it. I can be with you as you express it. We can do that in a safe way. And you teach safety of how to express that. So I teach, I, you'll hear this in session one, I teach kids who are angry how to jump. Because jumping is safe. So when they're angry, they can jump, right? I feel so mad and angry! And they're not hurting anybody. And then we model that when we feel mad or angry. And the reality is you can't stay mad very long when you're jumping. So it decreases it quite a bit. So it's a strategy that's rhythmic, it's relational, it's all those things, right? I don't know if that answered your question. I wish there was a great answer. The, the hardest part about working with these children is there's so many complex emotions that's going on inside of them, and they're trying to navigate and find ways to deal with that, right? So like I shared with you, I recently lost someone I care about. That's heavy stuff. My kids lost their grandma. We had a lot of kind of crazy behaviors for a couple of weeks. And I kind of got that. Like, how do you process loss? And then how do you process suicide? Those are big concepts. And as adults, we don't even have very good ways to do that. Okay? All right. So we've talked a lot about these two. Please, 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 can't say enough. Please, please, please look at basic needs. Look at the basic needs of kids. We miss the boat on that. Sometimes kids who've been through a lot of tra trauma or they're currently going through trauma don't get their basic needs met. And basic needs are what? Food, shelter, sleep, hydration, health, and, and relationship. Relationship, even though in Maslow's hierarchy it comes up a little bit, it really is a basic need. Right? I can't go through this world all alone without any contact and be okay. Now, I live on a mountaintop away from a lot of people because I like my space. <laughs> I love my space. But I live with my family and I have connection. Right? I was blown away, so I learned a lot about the human touch. So I, for the National Guard, I had to go do 30 days of my basic training, right? So I was away from my family for 30 days. So immediately, as an attachment person, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm breaking attachment with my children. They're gonna have an attachment rupture. This is gonna affect them for life, right? So I was proactive in all that. I wrote them a note that they could open every single day I was gone. For 30 days, they had a note, okay? 
Now my husband forgot a few days. <laughs> I was like, come on. But what I found at the end of that 30 days, for me, the hardest part of being gone was that my shoulders ached because I wasn't hugging my kids. I was surprised by that. I was surprised because I had not had touch in 30 days. So that's what I needed. And it made me have a whole different view of what that was like for my for kids who've been through trauma. Right? So I'm a healthy adult who knows that I need that, and that's what I missed the most in 30 days. I was 30 days of my adult life. Not a big deal. I can get through that. But for a kiddo who's never had that, doesn't even know that might be what they're missing, or maybe they have had that and they're removed and they're put into a foster family who maybe can't touch them or another family who maybe that's not happening and the ritual and the rhythm has changed. Can you imagine what that might be like? So just be thinking about that. That's a basic need, okay? We talked about timeout versus time in and containment. We, we, nice question, see? You were right on with that. This is a tough one because one of the natural things that we do in education is we remove kids from a situation. Right? We put them in the hallway, we send them to the principal, we do all these things when really what they need is help staying regulated. So we need to pull them closer and we need to help them regulate. Now, you have, you, there's lots of creative ways to do that. So one of the ideas that I use frequently with educators is kids who really struggle, you move their desk closest, right? Or you teach close to them. Remember my dog walking around the room, sitting next to the kid? Sometimes they need the human sitting next to them. It's not because they're in trouble. You might even be rubbing their back or touching their shoulder, right? My baby is regulated when I am touching my baby, when I am near my child. When we have a big separation and she doesn't know where I'm at, that's scary. Now, have you guys seen the video of the mom who she's tapped into the baby, goo, goo, ga, ga, everything's good, they're having an interaction? And then she leaves and she goes in another room and the baby becomes distressed. It's a powerful video. And she comes back. So that's what kids need. Remember, these kids have infant needs in bigger bodies. Okay? Oh, there's that empathy word again. Right? Empathy helps regulate. Empathy does not reason. I don't want to hear why I shouldn't do something until I'm regulated. We talked, we've definitely talked about this. Misbehaviors are symptoms. Okay? How many of you do behavior plans? How many of you do behavior plans that don't work? Okay. We talked about this a little bit in session one, but I'm going to go back to that. Behavior plans only work, A, if it's developmentally appropriate, and B, if there's a relationship. I am not going to set my infant up on a behavior plan based on how often they cry and I'll reward them on taking them to a restaurant. <laughs> you did so great today at the restaurant, good job, we'll go back next time. That is out of control silliness, right? But we do that to kids all the time. So if you make it through the whole day today, you get an extra recess tomorrow. The whole day. Do you know how long the whole day is? Right? I can barely sit in my seat for five minutes. You want me to go a whole day? So when you're thinking about rewards, you're thinking about behavior plans, you need to have a realistic view of what's going to be appropriate for a kid. If it's not realistic, don't do it because you're setting them up for failure and it's one more time they can't get it right. So I'm kind of anti-behavior plan, formal behavior plan. I'm kind of into negotiating, right? So, okay, buddy, let's talk about, you know, normally you set for five minutes or normally you get one assignment done. I'm kind of wondering if we can push it a little bit today and you can get one and a half done. <clears throat> Maybe you can do 10 problems really well and I need you to do 13. Can we get 11 done today? Remember in the video she said, give the correct dose. You have to meet them where they're at, right? We as adults come into these situations and we say, this has to happen for this kid to be successful. And we jump to the end to Z. 
and we've not done A, B, C, D. So we want to just do small steps of success. Helpful? We want to expand their window of tolerance. And if we try to go from here all the way over to here with nothing in between and no success, that's not going to work. And they're going to fail, and then it's going to be one more thing they failed at. Okay? All right, we talked a lot about de-escalating. If you cannot contribute to the problem without de-escalating, don't be a part of it. If you are amped up and you're so frustrated with a kid, you need a timeout. You need to ask for help. Because if you don't do that, then you're sending them one more message that they have failed in a relationship. Now, do we blow it? Absolutely. There are going to be moments that you get really frustrated and you yell at a kid. Or you go back to your blueprints. That happens. This happened to me about three weeks ago. Well, that's not true. The story's been going on for a long time. So I go into a home, really traumatized home. Lots of stuff going on. The kid has permission to smoke marijuana from everyone in her life. Now, keeping in mind, I live in Colorado. Marijuana is legal, okay? So, recreational, all right? So she has lots of access, okay? So I'm sitting there in the midst of this like crazy, crazy family session, and she leaves, and she comes back, and she reeks marijuana. And in my head, I'm like, I'm in the National Guard, and I'm sitting here with a family to smoke a pot. I'm going to get drug tested in two days. Abort, 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 abort. <laughs> so I abort. And I abort by calling her probation officer. I'm like, I ain't going back to the house. They're smoking pot all the time. I'm not putting myself in that situation. Like, it's a huge risk for me. I'm not doing it. Now, that is not at all how I handle stuff. Like, that's not in my repertoire usually. But I panicked. It was awful, right? So probation officer's like, what? What do you mean? Blah, 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 blah. She freaks out. She kind of knew what was happening, but I brought it to her attention in a more formalized way, and she couldn't deny it now. So that's fine, no problem. So she calls the client, and she's like, Stacy's not coming to the house anymore. And the client is pissed, right? I wasn't smoking pot. I went into my room. We had incense burning, like everything under the sun, right? So then I get a call like a month and a half later. Stacy, we need you back in the home. We're desperate, you're the only provider. And I'm like, you want me to go back in the home? Am I going back in the home? And they're like, the kid kind of wants to kill you anyway because she's mad at you, but we really want to work with you. I'm like, I don't know what to do about this. So I thought a lot about it and I'm like, all right, I'll go have a conversation with the kid because I did not have a conversation directly with the kid. And my agreement is I will not lie to you. And I didn't, I didn't deal with her directly. I went above her head and went to probation, and that was wrong on my part. So I went to her treatment center, like it's really complex, right? So I went to her treatment center, met with her and her therapist at the treatment center, and I owned my part. And they said, Stacy, she might punch you in the face. I said, all the more reason I don't want to work with her. But okay, we're moving on. So I went back in and I said, listen, I really blew it. I'm really sorry that I did that to you. I panicked. And I took her through all my fears about what was going on. I should have talked to you directly. I said, have you ever been in a situation where you've panicked and you didn't make the right decision? And she looked at her therapist, who she'd been working with for a long time, and she goes, no, never. She is such a reactive kid. That's kind of how she lives her whole life, right? She always panics. She always gets explosive. All these things happen. She goes, Stacy, I didn't know adults could do that. I go, well, we're living it. Like, this is what's going on. I said, I really would be interested in working with you again if you're interested in working with me. I'm not going to meet with you at your house, though, because I know that that's one of your coping skills, and I don't want to take any chances for me. And she said, I've never had anyone apologize to me. I've, every person who's ever hurt me has left my life forever. I said, well, what a great idea that you and I can sit down and we can work this out. And I'm owning my part. I'm really sorry. I said, in the future, if I have a problem, I'll talk to you about it directly. She said, I'd appreciate that. I feel like we can work this through. And I've been seeing her for the last month, every week. And it's been going pretty well. But I blew that. I did everything in the book that I know is wrong to do because I panicked. 
However, what a powerful situation, right? Then she asked me to come to court when she had to testify because of some abuse. What an honor. So when we own our stuff, that becomes pretty powerful to these kids. And it gives them an opportunity for repair and corrective experiences, which they don't always get. This kid is 16. She's never had someone apologize to her in a meaningful way, right? Not the I'm sorry, I'm sorry way, but in a meaningful way. We talked about structure. You guys using structure and consistency, predictability. Chaotic versus organized home school, right? Many of these children live in chaos. They don't know when they're going to eat. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know if mom or dad's going to be home. They don't know who they're going to be staying with. They don't always know who's coming in and out of the house, right? So I saw this family for a really long time. Every week, new people were living there. I'm like, I thought so-and-so was living here. Oh, they moved out. These moved in. So new people coming and going all the time. When you come to school and you have structure, that gets kind of crazy, right? Structure and predictability equal safety. When I know that I come into school and I can check and connect, then I know I'm safe. But if I don't know you're going to be gone, right, how many of our kids struggle with substitutes? Right? And what is that about? That's about safety. So my, my answer around that, can you get the same substitute every time? Sometimes you can't. You can ask for the same substitute. Sometimes you can let kids know when you're going to be gone. Sometimes, and I've had teachers do this, when they're homesick, they call in and they have the sub put them on speaker, and they say, hey, I just want to let you all know I'm homesick, but I'm alive and I'm okay. And that's addressing their attachment and their loss issues. Because when I'm scared that my person who feels safe is dead, I'm going to act out. And sick means a lot of things. When kids have their parents go to drug and alcohol treatment, a lot of times it's explained as your parents are sick. So if my teacher is sick and they miss school, does that mean they're going to be gone for a long time? They have different interpretations around that. Okay? Safety equals the ability to express emotions. We talked about that. You've got to be ready for these emotions to come out. You've got to go into the trauma with them. Okay. Did we cover silence and presence? We talked about being present and keeping your mouth shut. Silence is a huge tool. I cannot even begin to tell you the number of times that people will tell you your story because they don't like the uncomfortable silence. I, silence is probably one of my number one strategies. If I sat here and we sat here in silence for one minute, I guarantee you that people would be like, somebody talk, please. And that happens a lot. When you're just sitting with a kid, and you want to hear their story, and you're silent, they'll start telling it. All the kids come into my office and I'll say, you know, you know, because I can tell they're not in a place that ready to talk whatsoever. Or I don't know them really well yet, you know, the kids that I'm still getting to know. So they'll sit, and all this, I said, you, you are welcome to stay here, hang out, chill out, whatever, you know, de-escalate, whatever you need to do. We don't have to talk, but I'll be here. And I just, I, I do stuff at my desk, I'll be working. Yeah. So you're holding that space with them, Yeah. but you're available when they need to. And how many times do they start talking? They always do. Every time. I have yet to have this fail on me, <coughs> right? Because what that's all about, now if you're, if you're silent with them and you're totally distracted and your back's turned to them and they don't know that you're really available, they won't talk. But if you're open and you're kind of doing your thing and you're not staring directly at them, making them feel uncomfortable, they'll start to talk because they want to be heard. You think about that. Think about a time you've been really through a tough time and you want to be heard. Did you call your best friend and just bent and just <coughs> blah, 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 and they listened, right? That feels good. But what happens with kids is they think that adults know all the answers and that no one's going to listen to them. So silence can be one of your best tools in your toolbox. Silence for aggressive kids, if they're just kind of doing like this number, right, where they're just kind of pushing the boundary, like kicking stuff, but they're not really all in, they're just kind of wanting your attention, you can say, hey buddy, 
I hear you. I see what's going on. I recognize you want some attention. I'm here. You have my full undivided attention. Let's chat when you're ready. And you know that if this escalates, then the plan we talked about is going to be in place. But if you're upset, like, if you want to kick something, like, let's go outside. Let's kick something. <coughs> you know? <coughs> if you want to throw something, let's, let's go get a baseball. Let's go get a basketball. Let's go throw something. You know? I've done eggs. I have, I've, I've bought dozens of eggs for kids. And they can throw them. And one of the things I've done is have them write whatever it is that they're trying to get over, get through, and throw it, write it on the egg, and then they throw it. Powerful for them, right? I had a client who did coffee mugs, because everybody has too many coffee mugs. And so we're like, what can we do with coffee mugs? Oh, we can throw this. Of course, we clean them up and all the other stuff that goes with that. But it was like the glass shattering was such a, a great sensory experience for her. And she said, that's how my heart felt when A, B, or C happened, I felt shattered. So it gave us a chance to relate and connect. Music and movement, did we talk about music today? How many of you are gonna incorporate more music in your classroom? Okay. Movement, pattern, repetitive behaviors. Play, 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 play. We talk about play today? I hope so. All right, animals. How many of you have animals in your classroom? All right, what do you have? Who are you and where do you come to school? That's awesome. Do your kids love them? Our chickens, the little tiny ones, of course. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. Okay, who else has animals? Dog, right? Frog, awesome. Bearded dragon. Bearded dragon. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Not really warm and snuggly. <laughs> that's cool though. Absolutely, that's awesome. Dog. Dog? Yeah. We have seven rabbits, guinea pig, or gerbils, rats, frogs, turtles, fish. That's great. That's great. So the, my point around pets, right, is they can help manage heart rate. So I think I shared with you, there's a, there's a treatment center back east that they all have pocket pets. Every kid gets assigned a pet when they get there and they can pet the pet and it lowers their heart rate, right? So pets is a huge, huge, you know, de-escalator. So sometimes what I've done with kids, so I have Duke and I'll just be like, hey, Duke needs a walk. Or I put it on Duke, like Duke has an issue, I need you to take care of it. Or I've seen family or teachers who have like guinea pigs in their classroom and they know a kid's really escalated and that the kid is not gonna harm the animal. And they go over and they'll say, hey, can you please take, and they take the guinea pig and they put them in the kid's hands. And pretty soon the kid's boom, yeah. So I might even do that, you know, in the conversation about you stole the pen, I might have them hold the guinea pig before they steal the pen, before we have that conversation, right? Um, I had a kid every single time we came in to my office, he would start out really escalated. As soon as he started petting Duke, we could talk about anything. He could tell me all the worst things that have happened to him, right? And I've had something really interesting happen to Duke where he growled at me because I pushed a kid too far. And I was like, now Duke's very mellow. If he was here today, he'd be laying out here. You he wouldn't even move. You could walk over him and out the door, okay? But he got up and he got in my face and he was like, Rrr. and the kid was like, do you see? Do you see how scared I am? He even knows. And I was like, you're absolutely right. I'm done talking, no problem. We won't go any further. And I backed off and that kid felt protected, which was something that the kiddo had never felt before. So it was really important. I gave Duke a little high five. Talked about treatment teams. Did we talk about having fun? Why do I keep bringing that up? Why have I killed that, that lesson today? Because just lecture, lecture, lecture. That's all we hear anyways. They never hear praise or anything. Lighten up their life a little bit. They make all the difference. Even if they're tired, they're tired. They're tired. Right. Well, and for those... They haven't had a lot of fun in their life. They don't know how to do that. And for those of you who ra have raised kids or have children, how often do they play? All the time. All the time. Right? All the time. Well, like, they know when you're really playing with them, and when you're really not, you're just trying to, like, okay, I'll play with you. And then the kids are no honesty. So if you're really having fun, they're going to know you're honest and trust you. 
Absolutely, right? And kids are creative. They're always having these big, huge scenes in their head, and they want to do this, and they want to do that. And so when we engage in that, we can also teach in that. So some of our concepts can become fun and they can become learning opportunities, right? So if you don't know how to have fun, you gotta figure it out and you gotta bring that to your classroom, okay? All right, okay, I'm gonna stop right there for right now. We have exactly nine minutes. I wanna know if there's any questions, self-harming. We haven't talked about self-harming. All right, let's talk about that for a minute. <coughs> Anyone that you have who is a severe self-harmer needs to have an outside therapist as well, okay? Now, do you have a particular situation in mind about self-harming? Because I have all sorts of ideas around self-harming. No. Okay. So usually when I hear of self-harming, it's usually cutting. Okay. And it's usually teens. And it's usually girls. Now, that's not always 100% across the board. There's a, really, um, there's a couple really good books out there. There's one called Cut. And there's another one called The Red Scream. And they're both about cutting. I've shared those with clients and read parts of it with them before, but I would always recommend you read that first. Um, usually cutting is around a lot deeper stuff, and it's around I feel so much pain and the pain is so big that I need to cut to release it. So that tells me that if I have a cutter or somebody in my office who does that, and I had some severe stuff, like I've, I've had people cutting on all different parts of their body, it's around being able to hold that emotional space with them. It's about really listening and hearing the emotion that they feel. Okay? Now, can there also be this whole teenage girl, everyone doing it kind of thing that happens? Yes. And when that happens, I'm all about let's chat about self esteem and what can your body do for you? What is important about having your body? If you didn't have your body, what would that look like? Right? Because many times when you think about how, so self-esteem develops from the time we're born and we are valued and we realize we're lovable and that's how we develop our own self-esteem. Many of these people don't have self-esteem like that. They're hurting and they're struggling, right? And when they can relate to someone because they're also cutting, then that becomes a connection that they haven't had yet. So this is a super complex issue that you can't tackle on your own. You gotta have help and support with that. There's lots of reasons for it to occur. And it's not just all one reason, right? Do you have recommendations for like toddlers or younger schoolers that are showing signs of that? Or like by even teaching themselves? Yeah, so young kids who are self-destructive and who are doing self-harming stuff, that's again back to that emotional stuff. How do you express really big emotions, right? So some kids just feel really frustrated and really annoyed very intensely, right? And they don't know how to do what to do with that. And in our society, we don't do anger very well. It's kind of like all or nothing. There's not a lot of middle ground. So we want to teach how to express that in a safe way. That's one of the reasons I teach jumping because it's an emotional outlet. It's a physical outlet. Sometimes we need physicalness to express what's going on. That's why a lot of people are exercise when they're upset, you know, those things that are physical because you can get that out. So we have to teach little guys, like if you have trampolines, if you have, um, I've taught kids to do cartwheels or summer, somersaults when they're feeling frustrated, but it's a way to get that out. So punching people in the face, right? Like that feels really good, I'm guessing. I've never done that, but you know, it probably feels really good because it's an emotional outlet. And when you think about that experience, it's sensory. You're connecting with something, bounce houses, um, you know, those kind of things. Running, running and then crashing into like big pillows is really a bit therapeutic for little ones. Yeah. Run and, and it's, it's structured, but it allows that release. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things we see sometimes is kids who hit their head and they say they're stupid, right? I'm just so stupid, I can't handle this, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's because they're upset with their brain, right? So I'm mad at myself because I didn't do what I was supposed to be doing and I'm upset with my brain. So now you have internal dialogue happening, like see how it's multi-layered? And now you have to address, okay, well, we all make mistakes. So then you as the adults are modeling what do you do when you make mistakes? Oh my gosh, I didn't get that right. My brain didn't work. And you don't wanna, you know, you wanna take care of yourself. So we see that in little people, but we don't do a really good job of teaching them how to do that. 
You can't teach a kid how to express an emotion if they can't identify it. So you want to teach them how to identify it first, right? And some kids don't have a vocabulary around emotional expression. So that's one of the reasons we have to teach all about what sad, mad, glad, and scared are. Like those are the four I start with. Sad, mad, glad, and scared. And then we build on that. Confusion, disappointment, worry. And those are complicated. Most adults don't even know really what to do with that. So we want to take those complex concepts and say, what can you do when you feel happy? What, do you, what can you do when you feel mad? Right? And then you give them ideas and you practice that. Okay? So you've touched on how to deal with it with toddlers and how to deal with it with teenagers. Um, I was, I've been around a situation where there's a girl, she's about to pinch them doing things like pulling her own teeth since she was about nine. Pulling her own teeth, she took a razor to her thumb. Um, part of it, it's, she's, she's a bipolar child, but she also her body mass wouldn't allow for something like a bounce house because she also has an eating disorder where she eats too much. So her body mass is that of about a teenager, but her development is that of about, she's 10, probably about a seven year old. So you've got kind of, we've got the, something so like the bounce house wouldn't work for her because of her mass. Yeah. I'm going to disagree because I have a bounce house in my house and my husband and I get in it and we bounce all the time with our kids. So it depends on what kind of bounce house you have. All right, moving on. So one of the things that I will say though is many kids who've been through trauma have a lot of medical stuff. And one of the things is they can't always feel temperature. They can't always feel pain because their bodies have not been stimulated in a way to get that. So that's where you want to bring in other professionals who really get a sense of trauma and can help work with them around that, right? So I have kids who it's, you know, 10 below and they're outside in shorts and a t-shirt and they don't, literally don't feel that. And part of that's because they haven't been taught. It's not teaching in a cognitive sense, it's teaching in a relational sense around how to take care of your body, okay? Same thing happens for pain, right? A lot of kids who come into care, they can, they can slip and fall and break their arm and never shed a tear. Like they just don't feel pain. Right? That's a dissociative response. They have not been taken care of when they've felt pain, so they've stopped feeling that. So it's a long, drawn out process. I mean, you guys are asking great questions, and I don't have any great answers because it's, every kid is different, and you need a team to deal with that, and you need trauma informed team to deal with that. Right? And it's a long process to, to correct it. Okay? All right. Other questions? Was there anybody who showed up today who had a burning question that I have not answered? Okay, we have exactly 30 seconds. <laughs> I want to say thank you once again for you guys having me back today. I hope you're leaving with more strategies and more tools. I hope we went a little bit deeper today. It was a lot of review and covering up, uh, you know, recover, review and I don't know the word I'm looking for. Covering what we talked about in session one at a deeper level. You guys are pioneers, you're doing the right things. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for having me here today.